Hello folks, I'm back with another one. Um, I hope you and your family are well. Um, I hope this newfound old freedom, if you like, um, that we're, we're managing to have here in the UK is, is helping you both mentally and physically. Um, you know, as long as people are careful and considerate to others, I think lockdowns are... Um, coming out of lockdown is a, is a massive uh, step forward and a, a plus for all of us. Um, but yeah, I, 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 it's been a long time, hasn't it? Um, really, since I was uploading quite regularly. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit more chubbier. I'm a little bit more uglier. I've definitely got a lockdown haircut. Um, but I'm back now. Um I do aim to put videos out once a week in terms of me talking on the subjects of addiction um, along with hopefully guests permitting you know if I can get guests on um, with one you know guest interview per week as well um, that won't always happen with guests availability um, sourcing guests um, and other things happening in life but that's the aim two videos a week um probably this week it will just be the one but from next week i'm hoping i can get you two videos a week and hopefully as i always say it helps just one person so in this episode i do want to sort of on the back of well first of all the comments and the views I've received on this channel since the start but also during my absence has been it's blown me away to be honest um, especially while I've been away because many people could have seen that there was a fair amount of videos uploaded for a couple of months three four months and then nothing really and um, people could have easily thought well I'll, unsus I'll unsubscribe to him you know, he's lost interest, things like that. But that's not the case. Um, I'm blown away by the comments um, that people still are sending me directly and on videos, you know. it's It, it was my goal to help even just one person. And the feedback that I've had so far is that many people can relate to my videos, my stories, my thoughts on gambling addiction, addiction in general, mental health, um, and that it's helping some of them, you know, um, and also I've even had partners of people who have suffered addiction, with addiction and mental health, contact me to say thank you for giving me an understanding as to what goes off in a uh, person's head who's suffering from addiction which is something that I'm going to do more videos on um, but it's it's something also that I can only speak as I always say from my experiences and what I've learnt over the years um, through meeting people who have suffered with addiction and speaking to them and their partners and their families um, and, not, and it's just my opinion and my experiences um but it is helping people it seems and the 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 love that really i get and i know it sounds creepy and cringy but really i find it very much uh touching that people are um responding well to the videos that i have put out so thank you from you know i really genuinely mean it i do massively appreciate all your support, comments, likes, even shares, uh, inbox messages, you know, it's really much appreciated and um, when I set out this channel it wasn't to make money, it wasn't to get views so I could brag about having a big YouTube channel, it'll never be big. Um, I want these videos to get the views, to get the interaction, to get the likes because I do want that in turn to help the algorithm put these in in front of people who 
really can benefit from the from the monthly you know even just one person through liking the videos commenting interacting watching the videos one person who may be sat there in despair and it you know one of my videos turns up in his recommended or her recommended list who knows it could help them and i thank you all for giving it that chance so moving on why have i been absent um as i mentioned in a brief update video my mental health has been very much rocky if you like it's been uneasy over the last month or two um things have happened you know from small things to medium things to big things and it's you know we had the car that just completely broke down so um we had to source funds for a new car thanks to some amazing generosity from friends and family we we managed to get a car um and that was a small problem in the scheme of things because my, my little daughters had some more un floppy unresponsive episodes they only last 30 seconds or so each but it's still an unknown reason as to what's causing it so she's been in hospital a couple of times for tests and things and that's obviously had an impact on my mental health and then I will do a video at a later date on this but I lost my uncle but I was brought up with my grandparents um, who was his parents as well so he's more like a brother to me um, and sadly um, just a couple of weeks ago he passed away in a in a way that you know no one should pass away like that um and it's it's really boils down he suffered with addiction um to alcohol and i'm going to do a video on that because i just want to highlight what it can do from a family's point of view not just me going through it um from my point of view on the other side if you like and seeing him in the final end, you know, moments really because if people can hear what it's like in the final moments when you, you, you know, alcohol's done that to you, then maybe it can just help one person just, just not, you know, to reach out to, to just to help themselves not get there. So yeah, I will do a video on that, but like I say, it has impacted on my mental health. It also has um, kept me busy to some extent, sorting things out and things like that. So that explains really why I've been quite absent. Um, but in this video then, I do want to touch more on one of the comments that I've received, which is about my mental health story and I have touched on it in bits in my gambling addiction story and probably alcohol as well. I, I touched on it a little bit. Um, but I think people, you know, more than one comment really in one, one inbox have asked about how did it start my mental health deteriorating? Was there a cause? And what's it been like? And I think to answer that, in a short five ten minute video it's not realistic so i will obviously say that it, it might turn into a longer video um i appreciate not everyone's gonna spend 25 minutes listening to me waffle on but there we go i i i, I don't just want to put things out there with things missing and and the aim of it is a to answer people's questions but also it's not a sympathy oh look at him he's suffered with mental health it's not that it's there's still a taboo around mental health there's still a stiff upper lip 
especially in men, that exists. Um, it played a part in my brother's downfall, really. But in the wider um, community, in the wider scale of things, there is still that taboo around mental health. There is still a stiff upper lip. Uh, I don't need help. Help is weakness and I'm not speaking to a counsellor. I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. And people also, on the other side of that, feel a burden to people. Whereas I think if more people talk about their struggles with mental health, their struggles with addiction, their struggles in general, it breaks that taboo down and it, it starts to normalise what essentially has always been not normal, if you, if you get me. So I do want to start by saying my mental health has not been constantly down. It's not been horrendous for years and stayed that way. There has been moments where I've been fine. Um, sorry, there's been moments where I've been fine one minute and very much not the next. But generally, it's been fine for sometimes months and then very much the other way for weeks and months. Uh, so it's been up and down um, throughout my last 20 years or so. Um, and I think back now, I mean, I will try and keep it brief, but to give a background, I was always an happy go lucky child, playing out with friends, playing on the bike. I was brought up with my grandparents. They did a great job of that. I was always happy. Um, I did. I was shy, you know. But it was a case of... Was I shy around new people or was I shy around uh, just friends? In friends, no. New people, yeah. And the reason I mention that is because later in life that would play a, a part in my downfall, if you like, in the early years. Um, I had a best friend at school, as many people do. Um, and we did everything together. Football, uh, badminton, sports, just, just everything. Youth clubs. We, we did everything together. And going into comprehensive school for the first year, I was still friends with this 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 lad, and it, you know we had a circle of friends, and I was just everything was fine. But then we had a fallout, and what what happened with the fallout after that is, um, I started to feel isolated because the friends that we was both friends with went with him. He also met new friends. And so there was no sort of chance of reconnecting. Um, and then he moved away. And the thing with it is that in that time, I still had a select few people who I would speak to. But slowly, I began to go into my shell. And as I said, I was shy. Um, around new people so meeting new friends was hard for me um, and I wasn't the most confident of, of lads anyway I was never the most popular um, and I was always a big lad as I am now so that played a part in my confidence as well um, with girls and things like that so I, I began to be kept, you know, feel isolated and began to go within myself, if you like. Um, and it, it lasted, it, it started to, pro to progress, really, where I would often not smile at school, not be seen to be happy at school, because I wasn't. This meant that kids picked up on that, and I would often get called Smiler. It's just a word, it's just a name. But to me, it meant a lot more than that. Because then if I smiled or laughed, 
they would all make a fuss of me. You know, ah, ha, smiley, smiling, look. And the thing with it is that it now I wouldn't be so bothered. But back then, I didn't like a big fuss made of me. I didn't like attention being drawn to me. I still don't seek attention. <laughs> he says he's doing a YouTube channel, but, you know, I'm doing that for the right reasons. Um, I don't like a big massive fuss made of me. And by me smiling caused that, you know, flurry of children to uh, come over and pat me on the head and say, smiling, smiling. And it just, I, I didn't want that. And I became more and more within myself and isolated. And I felt it was me against the world um, at times. Uh, well, me against the, the, the school. Um, and then kids started to threaten me and bully me. Um, and it was only because I was within myself, I think, and um, my own best friend, if you like, I, I became very much hyper-vigilant to danger. These threats that they were making to beat me up and wait for me after school and things like that. I was, without sounding big-headed, I was always one step ahead of them. I would tell them that I've got holes dug out underneath fences, multiple uh, holes dug out that if they wait for me at this gate, I will be exiting through one of those. I never dug holes at all. But I told them that as a misdirection. So they may be wait at one end of the fence and I'd be escaping home to safety from a beating the other end of the fence. Um, but I was always one step ahead of them, you know. But what the threats did do is strike fear into me. So I didn't want to be beat up, surprisingly. Um... I would have my grandparents pick me up from school, one of them on a mobility school to poor, you know, poor lady, she, you know, she, she had to come out on a, on a mobility school to, to pick a, a, you know, now teenage son up from school, a grandson up from school, um, because he was that scared. And I stopped going out of my house, I just stayed in the garden. If I kicked the football over the fence, um, I wouldn't retrieve it because I didn't want to leave the safety of my garden. Um, and I didn't join any football teams or anything because I was shy and my weight. Um, I mean, football was my best friend, really. I was always in the garden with the football, driving my grandparents mad, kicking ball against wall. Um, and, I, I, you know, legend has it that I was quite decent playing football. I had vision, I had the, you know, the nous and the dedication. I just didn't have the the body <laughs> to be a footballer or the fitness. I, I'm not, you know, I wasn't an athlete then and I'm certainly not now. Um, but I was also limited because I wouldn't join teams because of my weight and my confidence um, and because I was shy um, so yeah why I'm saying all that is but is to highlight that this made me feel more isolated from children in general um, and that in itself can lead a child to be vulnerable to adults who are looking to abuse children because I found talking to adults a lot more easier a lot safer and a lot more comforting even strangers than to talk to children my own age and that is something that scares me because there's other people out there I'm sure who will feel how I did that talking to a stranger be it an adult is safer and more comforting and more social than talking to children their own age because of bullying, because of feeling isolated. And easily, I look back, there's times where things could have happened to me through speaking with these adults. 
Um, but fortunately, there was good people and, and nothing out of it did. Um, but eventually, I just left school. I wouldn't talk in lessons. I stopped talking. I was like Mr Bean, but it wasn't funny. I wouldn't talk. The teacher would ask me a question and I wouldn't answer. I would just literally look at them. Um, and when I got fed up with it, I'd walk out. I didn't care. Um, and eventually I just found peace and... Uh, what's the word? Comfort in going to watch my local football team train. Um, because the training ground wasn't far away from where I lived. I could walk over there. So I did that and I left school two years early. Um, barring a few special classes, if you like, um, where I'd go in the room one-to-one. -one. So, no GCSEs, no nothing. I leave school, um, mental health, hypervigilance, still very much in my thoughts, in my thinking, daily thinking, hourly thinking sometimes. It was in my thoughts when I was planning to go somewhere. And then, all of a sudden it turned. I was fed up of being bullied. I was fed up of living in a shell. And I started to retaliate when I would, we'd left school by this stage. When I would get on a bus to go and, you know, to town or whatever, I would see some of the people who bullied me and I would really become quite confrontational and I would really um, sometimes instigate a fight with them because the way I saw it is that they was the popular ones I was clearly struggling and they made it worse they picked up on that and made it worse not only that some of them threatened to you know threatened me to the point where I wouldn't dare go out the house so I became this confrontational person when I saw them and a fighting back person and quite often I would lose my rag with them when I saw them. Um, but it's this lowering of my hypervigilance that led to a um, an incident that really I wouldn't ever forget. Because when I met my wife, we did normal things, you know, when she's now my wife, she was obviously my girlfriend then. Um, I met her and we was just doing normal things, exploring the parks and shops and things that couples do when they first get together on dates and things. And we went on this summer's day to sit in the park and all of a sudden a gang of lads came up to me. Um, and my wife and assaulted me, you know, punched me and his friend come with a big knife, you know, really big knife and said, you know, words to the effect of your such and such empty your pockets uh, and my wife was told that she was going to be raped, basically do them favours um, and it was only what looked to be the gang leader they had a big dog with them the gang leader uh, sort of got spooked because all of a sudden he said leave it leave it come on lads leave it and the kid who hit me came running back and said I'm sorry you need an ambulance um, they dared me to do that well, some there that was because that would later have massive impact on my mental health. I would go on in in time to come to suffer from flashbacks and wake up in the night with it and have a fear of more than the average person of groups of lads having been through it at school as well. But... Essentially, I, I was back to the hypervigilant state where the threat of my wife being raped, the threat of me with a knife, 
would really run through my mind. What could have happened? What if they'd have done this? What if they didn't get spooked? They must have seen a member of the public or a policeman or something because they just left. Um, and like I said, that hypervigilance date came back. And eventually I got diagnosed with PTSD from a traumatic incident, which was that. And in later years, whenever there was a something big on the news in the local area, I remember one man who... Uh, this leads on to another big incident, really. Uh, I need to explain this properly, so bear with me. Because I don't want people getting the wrong idea. There was a man... My wife worked in a certain area... And there was a man who had raped more than one person in more than one location within that area. And my wife worked right there. Um, and he broke into the homes to rape, to do the rapes. And with her working on nights, I couldn't get it out of my head that he could possibly think, oh, there's a care home there. Where she worked at times, she no longer works in a care home or anything. Um, but at the time, she was really into that job. And I didn't want her to obviously leave work just because this might happen, but I believed that he could possibly think, there's a care home there, there's women working there, I'm going to get in and I'm going to rape him. Rationally, the chances of that are very slim, probably. But in my head, it was a very big possibility. Probably from the previous incident. And so my state of hypervigilance, my anxiety was just horrendous. I remember one day driving past the, the scene of the one of the rapes. And there was police tape up and there was officers there reassuring public and things like that. And I got some beer one day from the shop and I thought I'm just going to have a good drink and try to relax because my wife was at work on nights. And cut a long story short, I decided to go to the location where I'd earlier seen police. And I just said to the policeman... Um, because I thought they're working on the job, they're literally on the scene. So if they've caught this man, they would be the first to know. So then they could tell, if I asked them, they would tell me, yes, we've caught him, hopefully. Um, and then I can relax. I can relax. My wife's at work in that area, but the rapist has been caught. What happened is, I was anxious, I accept, I was a bit edgy, you know, but when I asked that question, have you caught him yet, I explained my mental health, I explained the PTSD from the previous ex incident, I explained why I'd um, come to the area, because they, they are literally, in my mind, the best people to ask, they're literally on the job. So any update as to finding the rapist, they would know. And that's all I wanted to know, that it had been caught and I could relax. And my wife could relax as well. Um, so yeah, that happened. I asked them, they said no. And I said thank you. And I went to walk back to my car. Suddenly 20 people, 20 officers surrounded me, handcuffed me and said, you're under arrest on suspicion of rape. Now the thing is, with that, there's a lot happened at police station. I, you know, I felt it was a bit of a setup when I got to the police station. Not a setup in terms of being arrested, but trying to pin it on me because I spoke to the, you know, they stripped me off left me with no clothes on because they didn't have any to fit me, just a blanket to cover me, there was females walking past. Um, 
But when I spoke to my solicitor, I explained the mental health issues and as to what was in my thinking to visit that area. And they... They said to me, so you're admitting that you've done it then? And I said, what? I'm explaining my thinking as to why I've visited that area and asked if you've caught the, the police have caught the man. And then I went in to see the doctor at the police station. And at the end of it, he said, so are you admitting that you've done this? And I, I just felt that maybe they was trying to pin it on me. Um, I just couldn't cope. On, on bail for rape, I was, for 24 hours. And it made me feel, feel uneasy. And as though that I was a rapist, because I was going into the shop and getting served by women who, if they knew I was on bail for rape, they would feel uneasy, obviously, um, and I'd done nothing wrong. And not only that, the impact on now not being able to trust the police, and the impact on the old, uh, what's the word, the old presence of them surrounding me, and arresting me and the enormity of being arrested on suspicion of rape. It's just horrendous, really. And it, I had a few weeks off work. Eventually, they, after a day, they rang me and said, we're dropping your clothes back off. And when the officer came to the door, I, just, I didn't even speak to him. I didn't look at him. I just lost all hope with with anything, really. But... I was in a bad way. Um, I, I, I was relieved a couple of days later by the news that the gentleman that did the rapes got arrested and he's now serving something between 12 and 15 years, I think it is. Um, he's, he's in prison now. But the, the, the very... At the very time that they arrested me, he did it. He, the man who did it was in a pub a mile away, drinking with his friends. And, you know, as much as I was pleased that they'd got him, when it came out, his appearance, you know, it said that he was six foot five or whatever it was. I'm not even six foot. Um, it was blonde hair, well, I've got dark hair. There was a few fairly obvious things that would make me not even be close to resembling this man, who they had down as a suspect. So, and description. So, DNA and everything, they ruled me out and eliminated me from the inquiries. So, why I'm mentioning all that is that That trust in police are gone and it's a part of my life where I felt pretty much in a place where if I can't trust the police who are there to protect us, who can I trust? And the enormity of being arrested for such a serious offence and the enormity of how I was dealt with at the police station, which eventually I got an apology for. It was just, it took its toll. And years later, uh, two years later, sorry, I, well, I stopped gambling for, for a period of time in this. Um, but it, two years later, I got pulled over for a minor speeding offence. Uh, not speed, not even speeding. I was in the middle lane for too long, lane hogging as a lorry driver. Um, and they pulled me over, the police. And up until this, I was okay mentally. I was doing well. And the police in a different part of the country pulled me over. And initially I was fine. And then the, they got in the cab with me. And the other... Officer climbed up into the cab. 
So once one officer was in there, I was okay. But when the other officer climbed up onto the stairs to get into the cab, I looked at the blue lights on the car that it was flashing, and I looked at the officers and I went, I went into a state where I now know that I had a panic attack. At the time, I didn't know what it was. But the officer was asking me questions and I couldn't answer him. I was breathing heavy and I was going, you know, fuzzy and weird. And what it did is it brought everything back from that previous wrongful arrest. All the emotions, all the feeling as though, uh, you know, outnumbered against me, you know, targeted in, in whatever, just the old thing, bullied, if you like, um, and really, they had every right, they had every rights to pull me over, um, you know, I was in the middle lane for too long, but it brought everything back, and from that day, I struggled, I struggled um, with police again, and I struggled with understanding that not all police are bad um, which I now know in later years I've come to respect them and again and trust them and whatnot. but so much so my mental health took a turn for the worse and I began to have what I now know as was panic attacks I wouldn't believe the doctor, as I've mentioned in previous videos. After my first major one, the, the one in the lorry was minor, but the, the major one was not long after that. I was convinced there was something wrong with my heart. I was having an heart attack and things like that. And I went down there with my mental health. I began to very much health anxiety. I very much was hypervigilant to all sorts of danger. I would often do things to uh, out of the ordinary to protect my wife and his family, you know. Uh, misdirection was a big part of that, you know, if someone asked me something where people would normally say, you know, where they're from or what the name is, I would give false names, false places of birth, and I would just do things that would not be normal at all. But I was struggling to trust people, and I was, like I said, very much vigilant to danger. Um, and it began to take its toll, and then my wife got ill with chronic illness, and in and out of hospital and I just ended up in a place where I was depressed, I was anxious and I was feeling that there's no light at the end of the tunnel and of course at this time as you know I was gambling heavily, really heavily as an addict but also as an escape um, and it, it, the thing with gambling you know as with any addiction, it, it takes it away for so long, but then it comes back. And eventually, it didn't even take it away. So, the mental health side of things in this period of time, as I said, I was depressed, I was very anxious, and I was very much putting all my eggs in one basket with believing that Counselling would be the magic pill for me to sort myself out mentally. I would call the crisis team. I was having suicidal thoughts as I've spoke about before. I was self-harming, cutting my arms regular, punching walls, uh, doing all sorts of little things to harm myself, you know. Um... And of course, in later years, I took the overdose, which was mental health and gambling addiction related. But 
In this time, I believe counsellors was my only way out. Until one day I'd spoke to the crisis team and begged to have a counsellor. Um, and it dawned on me that they haven't got a magic pill. You need to be able to work with them to work on yourself. But they can't do it for you. And they can give you all the tips and advice, but you've got to want to be open to the help. You've got to be sort of helping yourself and taking their advice and taking things from what they say and putting them into your life and your way of thinking. And before, I thought I'd go to a counsellor and they would basically give me a magic pill that took all my depression and anxiety away. Well, it didn't work like that. I saw counsellors. I had one that said I was, in better words, too messed up for her to see. Um, because I was coming into meetings where I wouldn't work on myself in terms of the homework. I wouldn't really do much what she'd asked me to do because I was just not well mentally. Um, and also because I chose to put work first. And why did I put work first? Because that was my gambling tokens. And why did I want gambling tokens? To escape. And why did I want to escape? Because I just couldn't cope. So then I wanted to see a counsellor. Then I won't put work in. I wouldn't work on myself. Why did I put work first? Because I wanted gambling tokens. Because I wanted to escape. And can you see the circle goes round and round and round. And the thing with it. I, I don't. You know everyone's different. These are my experiences. The thing with it is that. When you're in that vicious circle. It is hard to break out of. Pinning all your hopes on a counsellor or a GA meeting, AA meeting, thinking once I go once it'll be fine, I'll be free from addiction, I'll be free from mental health issues. Thinking like that is just not realistic. I think people who are struggling like that, struggling to break the cycle, need to be open to putting the work in themselves, taking the advice, listening, putting time and effort into your recovery from addiction or from a mental health state that's very much away from what you'd want it to be in a negative way. So, as we proceed with my mental health story, of course, as you know, I stopped gambling in 2018, December 27th, 2018. And I, on paper, people may look at that and think, surely your mental health uh, got better because you wasn't gambling, you wasn't causing the misery and things. Um, in this time, I took an overdose as well. But, you know that place where I took that overdose, it was a mixture of gambling, but a mixture of just no hope, I've had, I'd had enough, the causing pain and misery, but I had enough of all, with school what happened, and with police and things like that, I just had enough, and anyway, on paper, stopping gambling should in, improve mental health, yes, but also with mental health it's it's what it is it, it can work in all sorts of ways in a negative way in a positive way when i stopped gambling yes it improved because i wasn't causing the misery and pain to people and i was doing something positive but the guilt from what I had done, from what I had caused friends, family, my wife, 
Um, and the scars that I've got, uh, that my wife has to look at and things like that, it, it's all played a part in me struggling even today at times not all the time at times and so when i look and i think yeah i've stopped gambling in the early stages but i did all this i did that my wife's still upset my wife uh my you know my wife's not speaking to her father because of me uh my friends are not really speaking to me because of what i've done Guilt sinks in, and I struggled to get past it. And mentally, I've I felt as though I'm a failure. And what's the point? All I do is cause misery. And what happens then is, because of the guilt I was already carrying about previous mistakes, when I made a mistake now in my current life, and it still happens to this day. Maybe I don't do something for my wife or... And she tells me about it and I... F instantly, instead of just thinking... Kieran... You could have washed the pots there. You could have... Done that, you know... Uh, something or other. Instead of just thinking that... And thinking next time I'll do it... I think... I'm causing a misery again. I'm... I'm all that time I've caused a misery and still even though I've stopped gambling I'm causing a misery and pain and upset. I don't just mean with pots but that's just an example, you know. She doesn't cry if I don't do pots. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it's, it plagues me. It really does. Um, I'm very much still hypervigilant to danger. I still give people misdirection um, to an extent, you know, yes I've created a YouTube channel and things, I'm quite open on it, um, but there is still things that I don't really want to talk about and each to their own with that. And it's not that I think someone's going to turn up on my door. Um, it's not that I don't think someone's going to turn up on my door. It's the edging on side of caution um, that I think I'll always have with me now. Um, but when I say misdirection, I always speak about the truth. You know, there's no lies in this channel. Um, but personal details, maybe sometimes I have told things back. You know, uh, just because I'm just like setting my ways with it. Someone asked me earlier, where am I from? And I just gave them a completely false location of where I'm from. Um, they could find it out, you know, probably. Um, but I just didn't want to, I didn't feel comfortable. It was someone online when I was gaming. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm rambling a little bit there. But... To this day, I'm plagued with that, that guilt. I'm plagued with the feeling that I'm a failure. And I'm plagued with the fact that, as I mentioned before, circumstances that be, I can't work, I can't provide for my family. Um, and I'm plagued with the fact that after all these years of suffering with mental health issues, I've become a certain type of person and mostly if I give myself any credit I've got great intentions I want to help people I want to make people laugh I did comedy a little bit which is a long way from being a shy young lad at school um, I, I, I do want to be happy and be a good person and very much there's times where I am that. Um, but I still struggle with the fact that I did what I did. And I'm not saying for one minute that if you're out there and you've stopped gambling, you've stopped whatever addiction it is, or you've got to a place where you've done things in the past but your mental health's good, I'm not saying that you will struggle with 
your past like I have. There's people who are able to overcome it and you know, I look up to them people. Um just with me. People are different, they deal with things different. I seem to struggle with it. But I am hoping to get more help, realising that a counsellor's not magic we're going to make it all go away, but work on it. So, I think I've rambled on quite a lot in this video, and if you've got this far, thank you. And I hope just hearing me talk about certain experiences, certain ways I've thought about things, and how I've reacted to things, and what I do, you know, if you can relate and it helps you not feel alone if it encourages you to talk by whatever means to someone about your problems then to me even if just one person does that that's great but i appreciate it's a long video i am sorry for the length of time it's taken um but i felt i wanted to do it as i said to answer the questions because I have been asked about it, but also to break the taboo, or help break the taboo. Um, so yeah, on that note, I think I will wrap this video up, um, and uh, I just think going forward, videos, you know, how frequent they'll be, as I said, hopefully two a week from next week, one video on addiction, one interviewing someone, um, guest permitting. But yeah, I'll leave it at that, folks. Sorry I've rambled on and on and on and on and on. Um, I hope you're well, like I said. Thank you for all your comments and likes. If you can leave me a comment on this video, maybe you can relate if you want to let me know. If you've got a question, by all means ask. Um, I put all the Twitter and things in, and now you can contact me in the description below. Leave me a like, and um, let's help these videos, like I said, spread as far and wide as possible, and hopefully it can help just one person. Um, but yeah, I'll catch you next time, folks, and uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in, and thank you for sticking with me on this channel. Um, it is much appreciated. And I will see you on the next one, folks. Stay safe.